what? Welcome back. And a highly anticipated guest. A lot of people have been asking, because we teased it at the very beginning, <laughs> when are you having Terry Francona on the show? And Dad, you had even said before, this is going to be the biggest laugh that we've gotten on the show thus far. Right. I've covered baseball for 45 years, and no one in 45 years has made me laugh more than Tito Francona while being a future Hall of Fame manager. We've got a lot to get through, but Dad, I want to hear about your weekend. You have been a, a traveler. You were in California for a wedding, a family right. wedding. I went to a family wedding for Brett Townsend and his new wife, Michaela. And the point of the story, Jeff, is that wherever I go, there are great baseball fans everywhere. That's why we're doing this show, Jeff. So aunt, your Aunt Julie, my cousin Julie, made the mother of the groom speech. And she tailored the whole speech around Brett, her son, the Dodgers, and Shohei Otani. <laughs> Somehow, she did it beautifully, Draw the, drew these tremendous parallels between Brett's life and Shohei Otani ending up on the Dodgers. This is in the middle of the wedding. That's that's where baseball comes from. You expect that more from a father of the bride. Right, but, <laughs> but Julie loves the Dodgers. She loves Shohei, and she loves her son. So after the wedding, the next morning, we went to a winery. And Jeff, this is exactly what I'm talking about. We go to the Beckman Winery in Santa Barbara, okay? We meet Steve Beckman, who owns the winery. And I'm sitting right next to him in a private wine tasting. And he's looking at me, and he loves baseball, and he really understands it. So about halfway through the wine tasting, he, he's a big fantasy baseball player, and he goes, I just can't figure out who to play today, Estevan Floriel or Dylan Moore. Okay, th this is not Acuna or Shohei. Right. These are... Sorry, with all due respect, two rather obscure players. Right, right. And there he is, like, he can't figure out exactly what he wants to do for his lineup that day. My point is, wherever you go, Jeffrey, there are baseball fans everywhere. So I have a couple of messages from people who listen to Is This a Great Game or What? You can always message us on social media at what or at greatgamerwhat.com. Uh, Pete, quick question. He was asking about your source for box scores because they no longer are printed in your daily newspaper. At least a lot of them aren't. Where do you go to get your box scores when you consume them with a Diet Mountain Dew? Well, as you know, I cut them out every day for 20 years. But then our daily newspapers didn't have enough box scores every day, and it took me too long to hunt them down. So now I read my box scores on ESPN.com. Mm. And I've gotten so used to where everything is in the box score that I'm very much a creature of habit, as you well know. So when I want to know who hit a sacrifice fly or who got hit by a pitch or who grounded into a double play, I know where it is in the box score. Every box score is a little bit different. They're not all the same. So I go to ESPN.com. Let's talk about what's going on in the game right now. Some breaking news. All right. It's not exactly breaking, but Justin Verlander, age 41, made his his debut this year because he'd been on the injured list and he pitched really well for the Astros and boy, could they use some help because their yeah. pitching is all banged up. And he passed Phil Necro on the all time strikeout list into 12th place. And Phil Necro was a very underrated pitcher. And because he was the knuckleballer, people think he was just some circus act, which is ridiculous. Sort of knuckleball was really hard. But what I always loved about Phil Necro, he had a brother, Joe Necro, mm -hmm. who played in the major leagues, a pitcher also. He had like 1,200 plate appearances. He hit one home run, and he hit it off his brother, Phil. What? Seriously, Jeff. Wow. How could that possibly happen? As for great pitching, Tyler Glass now had another zero walk, 10 strikeout game. That's the second one this year. No one else has two for sure. He is he is like the most gifted physical specimen in the major leagues, according to Peter Fairbanks, who was his teammate with the race. Jeff, I've told you about him. He's 6'8". He weighs 225. He can do a standing backflip. And I know you did a standing backflip once, but he's 6'8", 225. Mm -hmm. He can also what what is called a flagpole, which I had never heard before. If you get on a, like in the weight room, you can get on the, like the, one of those racks and he can make his legs go parallel to the ground yeah. as he holds himself up. I mean, he's so gifted athletically. It allows him to do all sorts of things as a pitcher. And this doesn't apply to you and I, Jeff, but he told me when he was a junior in high school, he gained four inches during winter break. 
He said winter break lasted five weeks. He grew four inches oh in gosh. five weeks. I grew four inches in 20 years. I mean, and <laughs> he came back to school and everyone looked at him and said, what happened to you? Like you, you came back from winter break, a different player, 6'8", 225, amazing athlete. And so far this year, a great pitcher. Yeah, we've, and that's the thing is these growth spurts that people talk about, Still waiting. (laughs) We're both still waiting. Right. 67 and 30. All right. So the other thing is that John Sterling retired as a broadcaster. He was the play-by-play guy for the Yankees for 36 years. He worked in broadcasting for 64 years. He was 85 years old, and he just said, that's enough. Not because he didn't love it anymore, because John Sterling loves baseball. I love John Sterling. I loved his bizarre, creative home run calls, which are legendary. Uh, But it just proves the point, Jeff, that the play-by-play guy is a member of Mm. the family. Mm -hmm. They come into your living room every night. They speak to you every night. They are so critical a part of Major League Baseball. And I'm not sure everyone understands that. I bet if you ask the Dodger fans, who are the four greatest Dodgers of all time, one of them would be Vin Scully. I think if you ask the Cardinal fans, who are the four greatest Cardinals of all time, I think that one they would say Jack Buck is one of them. Harry Callis, who used to do the Phillies games, and now you love the Phillies. In 1993... The Phillies won the pennant. They went to the World Series. John Cruck, Crucky told me, all the players were in the clubhouse ready to celebrate, champagne in hand, and they would not celebrate until Harry Callis came down. A broadcaster, a play-by-play guy, came down into the clubhouse and sang the theme song for the Phillies. That's when it was official, when Harry came down to sing. That's how important the play-by-play guy is. And one of my favorites of all time was Ernie Harwell. Ernie Harwell, one of the kindest, sweetest men ever. Did the Tiger games forever. So Tiger Stadium closes. It folds and they get build a new stadium. So I say to, I say to Ernie, what are you going to take as kind of memorabilia from old Tiger Stadium? And he looks at me and he goes, I'm going to take the urinal from the visiting clubhouse. And I went, what? The urinal? I said, why would you want that? And he goes, well, it's very personal. And every great player in the history of the American League used that (laughs) urinal. And he said, I'm going to take it home and I'm going to make it into a planter for my wife. And that's exactly what he did. Got it cleaned up. And in the back of their house were all these plants planted in the urinal from the visiting clubhouse at Tiger Stadium. You know, most men would have to really go into detail. No, but honey, understand. (laughs) They peed in this. It would really work out that way. Only in baseball would somebody think of something like that. Did you hear what the Yankees got John Sterling on his last day? No. They bought him an 82-inch television. Really? And I have a lot of friends in New York. Most of them take Ubers or the subway. How are you going to get an 82-inch TV in an Uber? That's a good point, Jeff. Better better call an XL. When you're older... You can't watch a game on this. I'm amazed by you young people that can watch a game on your cell phone yeah. or on a tablet or even your laptop. I'm sorry. I, I've watched games on my laptop so I can watch two games at once. But I need a big TV. I don't need 82 inches, but I need a big TV. Yeah, you don't need a TV that's taller than you, right? So right. That, well, that also <laughs> rules out 65-inch TVs. <laughs> I'm five, four and a half. Leave it alone. Our special guest, Terry Francona, joining us, a storied manager. But this is his first year off as a manager since he worked with you at ESPN in 2013, was it? Uh, 2012. 2012. Right. We're going to get into that. But why not talk a little bit about the art of managing when it comes to Terry right, Francona? Jeff, there's, look, I'm very much in the minority on this. But I think there is an art to managing. I think there is wisdom and experience that comes with managing. That doesn't mean you have to have managed 10 years in the minor leagues and three years in winter ball in order to be a major league manager. But I'm telling you that it helps. The last three years, the World Series champion managers were Brian Snitker, Dusty Baker, and Bruce Bochy, all 65 or older when they won the World Series. No other time in the four major sports have three years in a row produced a manager slash coach that won at age 65 three years in a row. It shows you again what 
a feel for the game really means. And Tito had the best feel for the game of anyone. What he did, Jeff, was he could sense when his players were uptight. He could sense when the tension around the room was 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 they couldn't play their best. So he yeah. was the best at deflecting any sort of negative attention and he always did it usually with some sort of laugh, even with his players. But one day, I hope this comes across properly. He, This is, you know, 15 years ago, Daisuke Matsuzaka is pitching for the Red Sox, and he has a really difficult start. After the game in the media room, there are 50 people in there. This wonderful Japanese reporter tries to ask a question in English, okay? And the poor guy is trying so hard because it's broken English, it's terrible English, but he's really trying. And everyone in the room is really uncomfortable because the question is taking so long. It's like, you, yeah. you're uneasy. So after he finally finishes the question, Tito looks at the guy and goes, you're from Western Pennsylvania, aren't you? <laughs> Which is where Tito is from. <laughs> and that's what great veteran managers yeah. do. They never panic. I told you, Bruce Bochy lost 20 out of 30 games down the stretch last year for the Rangers. And instead of panicking, he pulled the team together by not panicking, and the team went, and on, went on to win the World Series. And that is a great common denominator of some of the best managers I've ever met. How's your Japanese? Oh my gosh. I have look, Jeff, we've been over this. My biggest mistake in life is that I majored in French in high school. Je m'appelle Timote, je parle le français un petit peu. That's all I can say. And 33% of the players speak Spanish, and I can't speak a word of Spanish or Russian or certainly Japanese. So how it, many players have ever spoken? Spoken French. Right. I have spoken French to a number of players, but now that Russell Martin has retired, I don't have anyone to talk to anymore. <laughs> so so that's too bad. But getting back to the managers, like Joe Torre was the absolute best at deflecting attention, taking it on himself or bringing it over there so his players could play. So Tino Martinez told me once, Tino's a star on the Yankees, but he is in the middle of a horrendous slump, the worst slump of his life. And Joe calls him in his office, and Tino walks in thinking, oh, my God, he's going to bench me. He's going to trade me. He's, uh, you know, he's going to yell at me. So Joe says to him, he says, um, writes it on a piece of paper, I want you to go to this restaurant tonight. They'll be waiting for you. It's a great Italian place, you know, upper Manhattan or something. And he said, and order this bottle of wine. It's the best. So Tino goes, eats Italian food, has a bottle of wine, comes back the next day and gets three hits. That's what you do, Jeff, when the game is this difficult because it will tear you to pieces and the really, really good managers recognize that that's how you do things. You know what's important about that story is it didn't come out until years later because imagine the New York media, if they said, then they sent him out for wine? He right. stinks right now. Right, right. But that was the beauty of Joe yeah. Torrey. Now, not all managers that I covered along the way handled things the same way. Like Earl Weaver, who I covered in Baltimore. Right. Earl Weaver, for me, is one of the three, four best managers of all time. Go look at his winning percentage. Earl did things a little differently, and he wasn't quite as warm and fuzzy. He didn't have the same bedside manner as, say, Tito Francona or Joe Torre. In fact, <laughs> once Earl had a, an outfielder named Pat Kelly. This is in the 70s. Pat Kelly was on the team, but he decided while playing baseball, he was going to join the ministry, which which he did. So he's waiting for the right moment to go speak to Earl Weaver, his manager, to tell him about his big plan in life. So he waits for this, finally, the poignant moment where he goes to Earl and he says, Earl, I'm going to walk with the Lord. And Earl said, I'd rather you walk with the bases loaded, which, <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, Earl. <laughs> Let's get into our game changer of the week. Every week, we're going to take a look at Major League Baseball and find one player who is uh, making a big impact. Who do you got this week? Well, this week's game changer for me is Travis Darno, the backup catcher for the Braves. Now, let's understand he's the backup catcher because Sean Murphy is the regular catcher, and that guy is really good. Travis Darno would be the, the primary catcher on well over half of the team, so it's unfair to call him a backup catcher, but Sean Murphy goes down and this is where teamwork comes in this is what being a great teammate is all about he says all right i'm the everyday catcher again so the other day 
He had three home runs in one game. <laughs> now, Jeff, it's the second time in his career that he has hit three home runs in one game. So only three catchers now in the history of baseball have multiple three home run games. One is Johnny Bench, the greatest catcher of all time, who you met at Cooperstown that mm-hmm. day. The other is Gary Carter, also a Hall of Famer for me, one of the five, six, seven greatest catchers of all time, and Travis Darno. You're telling me Mike Piazza never hit two three run home run no, games? Two, no, Mike Pi- and what? Jeff. Here's the point: David or <laughs> David Ortiz never had a three homer game, and he had 500 homers. Gary Sheffield never had a three homer game. 500 homers. Rafael Palmero never had a three homer game and hit 500 homers. Hank Aaron hit 755 home runs, and he had one three homer game. Are you kidding? So Travis Darno has more homers, <laughs> three homer games than Hank Aaron. But again, it speaks to the way we play the game today, Jeff. The ball flies out of the ballpark. We strike out all the time. We're not as interested in putting the ball in play like Hank Aaron did because Hank Aaron, by the way, if you take away all of Hank Aaron's home runs, he still has a 755. He still has 3,000 hits. That's how great Hank Aaron. Was. Oh my goodness, that that's insane. Now speaking of home runs on this state in baseball, a very important day for a member of baseball right. who's important to our family. Right uh, on this date, by the way, Hank Aaron hit his first major league homer on this date. Also on this date in 1939, Ted Williams hit his first major league homer, oh, the wow. first of the first of well over 500 homers, and he would have hit 521. He would have hit 700 if not for all the service that he put in in the Korean War and World War II. That's how great Ted Williams was. I have told you my Ted Williams story. I'm going to tell you again. Your grandfather, Pop, my dad, was the greatest Red Sox fan growing up as a kid, and Ted Williams was his favorite player. So I grew up to stories about Ted Williams. So it's Old Timers Day, 1982, in Boston at Fenway Park. And I'm covering the Rangers, and my team is there for old timers day. So I'm on the field and all these hall of famers are out in the field, Bobby door, all these guys and out of the dugout comes Ted Williams. And he walks right by me. I'm 10 feet from home plate. He takes off his jacket. He gets in the batter's box and he digs in Jeff, just like pop told me, just like 1941. His setup is exactly the same. I remember it because I've seen it a million times. First pitch of batting practice. And he's, 62 years old, the first pitch of batting practice, he hits a shot that bounces once and goes into the bullpen in right center field on the first pitch. I almost started to cry. No cell phones back then. I After the BP was over, of course, I ran up to the, to the press box and I called Pop and I said, Pop, I just saw Ted Williams hit from 10 feet away and it was absolutely breathtaking. So I saw Ted Williams hit. Now, I heard this story from your Uncle Andy, my brother Andy, one of the great, maybe the greatest baseball player ever to play at Catholic University. I'm sure there'll be an argument, but it's close no matter what. So Uncle Andy used to be the ball boy occasionally, maybe 10 times, at Washington Senators games in the late 60s because his buddy Eddie Baxter's dad, Fred Baxter was the equipment manager. So they needed guys to be ball boys down the the Mm -hmm. line. So Ted Williams is the manager of the team in 1969. And Andy is there as a ball boy, but he gets to shag balls during batting practice. And Ted steps in the box during batting practice and hits the line drive at your Uncle Andy, who spears it like this. I'd never heard that story before. And Ted Williams looks at your Uncle Andy, my biggest brother, and he said, sign that kid up. And I said, Panda, how could you go 71 years in your life and never tell me a story that you caught a line drive hit by Ted Williams? How great is that? Yeah, Dad's like, you've wasted my time. <laughs> you know this is the only thing I live for, right. and you never told me that? That's how I would introduce myself. Hi, I'm Tim Kirkshin. I once caught a line drive hit, <laughs> hit by Ted Williams. So also on this date, uh, Jeff, Warren Spahn was born in 1921. 
Warren Spahn is arguably the best left-handed pitcher of all time. He's the winningest left-handed pitcher of all time. He was a war hero. He was on the bridge at Remagen when we went into German territory. I mean, he, he was a true war hero. Didn't even start his major league career until he was like 26 years old and still won 363 wow. games. So I, I may have to get some help here, Jeff, but... He won 363 games, and I knew this. He also got 363 hits in his career. But a guy named Paul Swanick, I love this guy. I've never even met him before. He sent something out on X on Twitter that that uh, Warren Spahn won 356 games. Get it right. Check the notes. Right. 356 games for the Braves, four for the Mets, and three for the Giants. Okay? Okay. He also, I told you, got the same number of hits. He had the exact same number of hits, 356 for the Braves, four for the Mets, and three for the Giants. So his win total and his hit total wasn't just the same overall. It was exactly the same for the three teams that he played. Who was the guy who sent this on Twitter? Paul Swanick. And I need, to, I need to meet him because it was fascinating. He wrote something. I'm sure Tim knows this. Well, I knew the 363 and 363. I didn't know they were evenly divided. Fascinating. Can I just give you props for also calling it X? Well, uh, you've yeah. done, I'm very proud of you. That's well, something a lot of people, myself included, don't even call it X. I, well, I'm just right, so I'm trying trained. to get better at this, Jeff. All right, so tell us, what do you got for Quirk Gins? Okay, we have a lot of name stuff this week. Okay, Wilson Contreras, who's the catcher for the Cardinals, and his brother, William Contreras, who's having a great year, is a wildly underrated offensive player. They started against each other in the same game, which has happened before, but they were both hitting second in the order. That's an odd place for a catcher to hit generally. So in the box score on Sunday, there were two catchers in the same game with the same name and their brothers. And it's never happened since 1900 that brothers started behind the plate and both of them hit second in the order. Wow. Jeff, I, I can't even begin to tell you how happy this makes me <laughs> when I come up with something like that, and then I have to go to Frank at the Elias and say, I, I'm betting this has never happened, and he writes me back. You're right. This has never happened before. You know, it's funny you brought up brothers because one of my favorite quirk gins brought to you by our friend Sarah Langs, who is just a genius mind. If you don't follow her on Twitter, we're going to have to have her on the show as well. She made a note during the playoffs... I can't remember if it's last season or 2022 that Aaron Nola faced his brother Austin right, Nola right. in the playoffs and the fastest recorded velocity of a pitch thrown by right. Aaron Nola 1 and 2 right. of his whole career in the Statcast era was against his brother. So and here he is throwing harder than he ever has before because he's like I got to get this guy out. Right. And that's the only time in major league history that a playoff game happened in which a brother pitched to his brother, and one is the pitcher and the other is the catcher on the other team. That had never happened before either. And, that, and Jeff, that's why I love to read the box scores because there's no telling what you might see. We talked about Jackson Holiday last mm-hmm. week. There's also Jackson Churio of the Brewers. He's also 20 years old. And Jackson Merrill of the Padres. Three soon to be star rookies all with the same name Jackson so when Jackson Holiday and Jackson Churio went up against each other in a game it's the first time two position players named Jackson played against each other in the history of baseball and as soon as that series was over the Brewers played the Padres where Jackson Churio played against Jackson Merrill. So there had never been a game in Major League history where two position players named Jackson played against each other, and then it happened six games in a row involving the Brewers. All right, one stat note, which I I, I love. Tyler Stevenson mm-hmm. hit of the Reds hit a grand slam in the first inning the other day. Now, Jeff, think about a grand slam in the first inning. It doesn't happen very often. Well, it's happened four times already. And I was surprised to hear it had happened four times in Major League history before this year. But 1997 was the only other season in which there were five first-inning Grand Slams hit in 
in the month of April. All right. Wow. So now I'll be searching. I can't wait for someone else to maybe hit a first inning grand slam. So we will have five. These are the things I love. Now, this is a real stretch, Jeff, but the twins have an outfielder named Austin Martin. Now, I I kind of fudge things, but it sounds like a car, an Aston Martin. So I I I have nothing else to do with my life. I was coming home on an airplane last night, and when I wasn't watching Bridesmaids, I decided to come up with the all car team. Now that we have oh, no. Austin Martin in the outfield, okay. okay. So let's see if I can do this by memory. Uh, for me, your mean Mercedes is the catcher, okay. Paul Sorrento is at first. Yeah. Damian Rolls is at second. Royce Lewis is at shortstop. But you have to say those right together. Rolls, Royce. Otherwise, I really Rolls don't have. Royce for the double right. play. I yeah. don't have a shortstop. There was a guy named John Dodge. Never heard of him. He played a million years ago. He's our third baseman. Ichiro Suzuki. Suzuki. Good one. Ruben Sierra. Yep. Austin Martin. And we got a pretty good pitching yeah, staff. You got a minivan in the outfield. Right. <laughs> Whitey Ford. Tim Hudson, Brad Lincoln, John Bentley, and just for you, Ranger Suarez. Uh, so I just came up with a 15-man team with, with things after names. This is what I did on an airplane last night in a middle seat on American Airlines. Seriously, what else was I supposed to do? As they say, let's rip it. Okay. Okay, so it's in the cards and our first stop. We've got Sean Murphy of the Atlanta Braves. Right. Really good player. And what struck me about him is when I talked to him a few years ago about his high school career, he he had the highest batting average in the history of his high school except for one guy, Kirk Herbstreet, had a, <laughs> from his high school, was the only one ever to go to his high school who had a higher batting average than him. And he was the quarterback. All right. Let's keep rolling through here. Oh, this is a good one, too. Juan Soto, but this is an older card. It's got the Padres jersey on. Right. So Juan Soto is one of the best young hitters that anyone has ever seen. He's already got 500 hits and 500 walks at this age. It's unbelievable. And he is one of three players in Major League history to hit a cleanup in a World Series game at age 20. Ty Cobb, Miguel Cabrera, Juan Soto. That's the list. All right. Also, it's in the cards. We got Corey Seager. All right. Corey Seager, to me, is the best shortstop in baseball, second in the MVP last year. And, Jeff, I covered their basically their entire postseason last year. I never saw him hit on the field, take batting practice on the field one time. He brings his tripod around with him into the batting cage indoors, and his tripod, which has his iPad on it, is what he uses to calculate his swing and do it perfectly. And he's such a great hitter. Who can argue? But he doesn't hit on the field with his team. He hits inside. And as Brad Miller, one of his teammates last year, said, his tripod is hitting 380 this postseason. His that's, tripod. Yeah, that's how good Corey <laughs> Seager is. All right, let's move on. Oh, a real character in our game, Joey Votto. All right, Joey Votto is a future Hall of Famer. He's one of the greatest hitters I've ever seen. And I'll never forget a few years ago, well, maybe 10 years ago, I'm in spring training, and he's taking BP, and he is lining balls. He's a left-handed hitter over the, the, the third-base dugout, just hitting line drives into, into the stands like that. And finally, I had to say, and he did it on every pitch. I said, Joey, what are you doing? And he goes, well, there are times in a game where you really have to spoil a really good pitch by just getting a piece of it, fouling it off to keep the at-bat alive. That's what he was practicing that day, and that's one reason he'll be in the Hall of Fame someday. I thought he wanted to wake up some players in the dugout. <laughs> when, the, when the game gets boring, I kind of wanted to make sure everybody was still there. JT Real Muto, our final one for It's in the Cards. Yeah, I love He's one of the best catchers in the game. His pop time is unprecedented. My pop time, by the way, Giant Mountain Dew, 6 o'clock in the morning. But his <laughs> pop time, home to second base, is the fastest in the game. And I love that he used to be a short shortstop in high mm -hmm. school and he became a catcher he told me when a scout was there to watch him play shortstop because he was going to get drafted as a shortstop but the catcher got hurt so he had to catch he'd never caught before and he did such a great job that the the, the scout said look 
we'll draft you as a shortstop. But if you want to be a catcher and move up the ranks a little quicker, you could be a catcher right now. That's how he got signed is the scout saw him catch one game when he basically had never caught before. League in the lid. Are you ready? Yes. Every week uh, we put all of the teams in Major League Baseball in this hat here. And then dad is forced to tell a story off the top of his dome <laughs> as quickly as he can. So we've taken out the ones we've already done. And this week you've got the Kansas City Royals. Oh boy. This is really good, Jeff, because they are off to a tremendous start, a surprisingly good start. Offensively, they're way better than I thought. Their starting pitching has a chance to be really good now that Seth Lugo and Michael Walker have joined the team, Alec Marsh, young guy, and of course they have Brady Singer and Cole Reagans. They have a pretty good pitching staff in their rotation right now, but their offense has been demonstrably better than it was last year. And Bobby Witt has a chance someday to be you know, one of the greatest uh, Royals ever, but he, he can't be the greatest one because that's always, sorry, going to be George Brett. Here's, here's how great George Brett was. This is a true story, Jeff. He injured his ankle during the p- prime of his career. So he was on crutches and they had a uh, team golf tournament, but he couldn't play because he's got a broken ankle basically. So he's just welcoming everyone through the 18th green when they come in because he's the best player on the team. He's the captain of the team. So one group decides to have a little fun and hit into the group that is putting on the green. Okay. So George Brett is standing there on crutches. He's got his putter with him and he sees a ball coming, a golf ball from 150 yards away. I'm not making this up. He takes his putter, which has a, you know, a a blade that's this wide. He hits the ball out of midair and hits it 150 150 yards back down the fairway. And I I say to him, George, come on, that's impossible. That could have never happened. And he said, well, it was 1980. And that was the year he hit 390. And every time he swung anything, he hit the ball really hard. Yeah, and that year, I wouldn't be surprised if he hit it 150 miles. Right. Back at him. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep updated with our sack fly tracker. Max Muncy now has, of the Dodgers, now has three sacrifice flies in the first three weeks of the season. So uh, the, Joey Gallo is the all-time sacrifice fly guy. He's a walking note when it comes. Joey Gallo has three sacrifice flies in his career and he's played like seven or eight years he hit 96 home runs before he hit his first sacrifice fly in the major leagues think about that for a second 96 times he hit a ball over a fence and not one of them like landed in the outfielder's glove on the warning track and scored a runner from third willie mo pena has the second most homers 50 before hitting his first sacrifice fly. So anytime Joey Gallo hits a sacrifice fly, it's something to celebrate. And Max Muncy already has three of them. That's our sack fly tracker. And our Kirkshin quandary is a bit of a hypothetical. Okay, you take 20 Major League Baseball players. These are the kind of things my dad and I debate for hours on end. <laughs> and we want you to debate with us as well on our social media at Great Game or what or at Kirkshin underscore ESPN as well. 20 of Major League Baseball's best soccer players right across the entire sport we're going to give them two whole months away from baseball and focusing and specifically trained by the best soccer trainers and coaches for two months and after two months you take those 20 players you put them on the pitch against the usa men's soccer team now we're not saying it's going to be close (laughs) we're also not saying it's going to be a blowout we're curious, are they going to lose 5-0? to zero? 10 to 0? Will they score a goal? Will they get destroyed? What do you think, Dad? Well, it would first end up off, being? there have been a lot of baseball players who are good soccer players. Jeff Bagwell, great soccer player. Cal Ripken, great soccer player. Omar Vizquel, I watched him dribble a ball off his foot one day. He could do it with his eyes closed. Nomar Garcia Parra. Great soccer player. Not as good as his wife. Right. His wife's better. (laughs) So I'm saying if you took the best 20, train them, I still think they would lose at least 25 to nothing. There's no way they're going to score a goal against a World Cup team. There's zero chance they're going to. But I'm saying with as athletic as baseball players are, I don't think 
Well, maybe it'll be 30 to nothing. I just don't know if you can see how, how long is a soccer game? 90 minutes. Yeah. All right. I, that would be scoring a goal every three minutes. I think that would be hard to do. And who would the goalie be? How about Aaron judge in goal? Six foot eight, rangy athletic beyond words can, can really run. I, I, I don't know if they can score 30 goals, but they could come close. It would be, say, 28 to nothing. I I think you're underestimating, hope I don't disrespect you, the competitiveness of these baseball players where they would say after giving up like five goals in the first 10 minutes, okay, we've got to figure out a new plan. Everybody on defense, right? We're not attacking anything. We are going to prevent them from scoring in any way possible. And they will find a way to stop them from scoring in the sense of not giving up a goal every well, I three asked minutes. This to a former major league player, and I said, um, Landon Donovan, who wasn't a particularly good big guy, but one of the great soccer players of all time, I said, Landon Donovan would run circles around you, right? And the guy said, well, he wouldn't do that for long because he was implying, I'm going to knock him down. Right. I'm going to hurt him before he <laughs> embarrasses me in an athletic competition. I'm going with 28 to nothing. I'd be interested to see what everyone else thinks. Yeah, and our Kirkshin Quandary, you can always respond at Great Game or What on social media or on our website, greatgamerwhat.com. All right, we've all been super excited. Terry Francona, former manager great of the Phillies, of the Boston Red Sox, many, many championships with them of the Indians, then Guardians, and uh, his first year not being a manager since 2012 when he was on the bus for <laughs> spring training with my dad. We're going to ask him about that. We're going to ask him about managing Michael Jordan in minor league baseball and so much more. Get ready for the laughs with Terry Francona coming up next. Is this is a great game or what with an amazing guest he was actually number one on our list when we dreamt of doing this podcast together it's tito francona joining the show Woo! you guys you just went down in my estimation <laughs> if i'm number one i hate to see who number two three and four is right T- <laughs> tito the only person worse in the world in technology than me i'm gonna guess is you i mean can you even explain how this works that you and i are doing this at our age well okay first of all i am i thought i was the worst <laughs> And then when you sent me that text that had my AOL account from 1967 or whatever, you you took the lead. But the fact that we got this working, I'm guessing your son must be pretty good because neither one of us has a chance to do this. Tito, he is a magician with this, and he lives in Philadelphia. I drive three hours to go tape the show with him because I'm afraid to try to tape it without him sitting next to me. I, I, my, my seven and nine year old grandkids, they get on my phone and they start hitting buttons. And I'm like, where, where'd you find that? They're, they're unbelievable. That, you know, Tito, I pulled up my dad's phone the other day and I noticed he had his mail app three different times. I didn't even know you could duplicate an app on an iPhone. He has it on three different pages and you didn't even <laughs> look at him now. He's saying, I don't even realize that, I did that. Is that male, M-A-I-L or M-A-L-E? That's how little <laughs> I know. I'm glad it's the first one. Good. <laughs> so Tito, this is your first season not wearing a uniform since 2012. And at that point, you were working for ESPN with my dad and you guys were rocking spring training together this is a very different feeling than 2012 right yeah because 2012 i i i hoped i was taking a break you know like i (laughs) i needed it i was burned out and i needed to do something else and the espn thing was actually and i didn't know it at the time but it was perfect i met more good people including your dad. And I got a chance to step away from the emotion of wins and losses. And and after a period of time, I started to miss the game again, which was actually really good. This time around, you know, I, I just felt like it was time. Um, mm-hmm. I was fortunate that I got a kind of got to write my own script, which doesn't happen very often. Um, not too many times when you leave a job, you still love your bosses and, you know, respect them like crazy. And I just thought it was time. So, so it is a little different this time around. 
I'm sure it is too, because if I recall, you had some interesting housing. Your first spring training with ESPN with my dad. Is that true? <laughs> it, it's so true. And, and you know, normally stories get embellished with time. This one didn't really need to. Um, I pull into Orlando, and it's my first time with ESPN in spring training. And I'm kind of nervous and have some anxiety. And I pull into this log cabin type <laughs> Type. Tim, what was it called? It was called Camp Wilderness. Yeah, 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 <laughs> that, which was very apropos. And I get to my room, and I just know somebody's playing a joke on me. Like, I keep waiting for somebody to come out of the, you know, out of the closet, like, hey, welcome to your new job. And I called Tim in his place, and I'm like, hey, man, let, let's go cook some s'mores. <laughs> and I remember being hungry. And calling the lobby, and the lobby was like, did you see that uh, that vending machine? I said, yeah. They go, that's our room service. <laughs> Jeff, they had bunk beds in our room. It's like we were in the Cub Scouts. He won two World Series with the Red Sox, and they put us in the middle of the woods in a <laughs> log cabin. Do you want to go it's make so some s'mores? True. Oh, it was so and, and hilarious. You know what, Tim? The one thing, there was one phone in my place, <laughs> and it was on the opposite side of where the bunk beds were. So if somebody called, which I'm sure it was you, I couldn't get to the phone in time. <laughs> it was like but you know what? It was, it, it's, it kind of encapsulates our time there because everything we did, we had fun. And I think that's the way it's supposed to be. Right. Well, that, Tito, I have to say that was kind of the culmination, the beginning of where Tim Kirkshin impressions kind of became a little bit of a norm. And Tito, we have you to thank for this, for bringing JP Aaron Sevia up on television. Is that right? Yeah, he was sure. He was sure. Uh, we tried to surprise your dad a little bit and have a little fun. <laughs> JP was like all about it. I wasn't sure how he'd react to it, but he loved it. And we all had a lot of fun with it. And that's part of what we tried to do, I think, is, you know, all of us together, we just had fun enjoying baseball. And I think that's maybe sometimes gets lost in today's world. And I'm glad we didn't. Right. He didn't just surprise me. He ambushed me, Tito did, on the air with this impersonation from J.P. Aaron Sebia. I was completely taken aback. My voice climbed like five more octaves because I didn't even know what was going on. It was so funny. And it brought in a chain reaction. Every clubhouse I went to after that, someone else had a terrible Tim Kirkchen impersonation. <laughs> Finally, I went to J.P. Aaron Sebia and I told him, please tell me you do other guys. Tell me that you can you can do Jack Nicholson. And he goes, no, I, I can only do you. So he only does one impersonation. <laughs> and it's a dopey little sports writer. Tim, let me let me tell you something. We were I was driving home with some friends from L.A. the other day. We had gone over to watch the University of Arizona basketball and we're coming back to Tucson. And, you know, we're not very happy because they played like crap. And my buddy turns on the MLB channel and there's a game on. And he said, oh, man, I wonder who's announcing. And I said, looked at him. I said, if you don't know that's Tim Kirchin, man. You <laughs> that was the Braves-Phillies game on Saturday. Thank you so much for listening. We, we I listened had... to the whole game. And, and I, I looked at him like, how can you not know that's Tim Kirchin? <laughs> Yeah, the, the childish joy in his voice should give it away. They, they, they're not sure if this is a kid of one of the players getting excited about calling the game or Tim Kirkson. Right, right. I can say that because I have the same voice. So. That, that, <laughs> Tito, that same spring, tell us about the time that you, the former manager of the Red Sox, had to go to Yankee camp and interview some players with the Yankees. Yeah, I mean, that was that was obviously – different is is a, is probably the best word because you know when you're the manager of the Red Sox people don't want to see you talking to Yankees I mean I used to remember go see Joe Torre behind the behind the you know in the by the clubhouse and say hello to him because people didn't want to see you out there mixing it up with 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 the Yankees that's just the way it was but because of guys like Jeter guys I had so much respect for 
you know, once you get out of uniform, it, you know, life changes a little bit and it's, it's not that push pull that you feel so much when you're in uniform. Right. And Tina, what were you wearing that day? Do you remember the suit you were wearing that day to interview the Yankees? <laughs> Is that the one that I had to go get it? Uh, uh, Today's with... man. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, we, you know, I, there's a there's why is there so many stories that, and I'm included in all of them. How much did the suit cost? You know, tell the truth. I know uh, you told me. I think it was seventy five dollars. <laughs> but you know what the worst part was? Who's the 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 gal that did our makeup? Real nice from Pennsylvania, from Susie. Western Pennsylvania. Susie. Susie. Susie Pop. After yeah. that day. She made a comment to me. She goes, Tito, she goes, you look so nice today. And I remember thinking, God, what do I look like on the other days? <laughs> and what did you do with the $75 suit when you were finished with that day with the Yankees? Oh, the minute the minute I, I, I balled it up and threw it in the wastebasket and put my sweats <laughs> back on and took off. <laughs> Tito, you were right. We had so much fun back then, which is what is baseball is all about. Now, again, Tito, you're not in a uniform. You're in Tucson. You're not in Cleveland. What are you doing with yourself these days? Are you watching the Guardians games? What are you doing to stay active since you love the game so much? Well, you know what? It's actually allowing me to love it so much, which I like because – I think I got to a point the last couple of years where everything was so hard, whether it was physically or even mentally, that I really wasn't watching a ton of baseball, just like the teams we were going to play. And that wasn't for enjoyment. It was just to kind of get ready for a series. I catch myself now, you know, if I look on my phone and I see a scores close, you know, I'll turn the game on late and see what happens and, uh, and I still love listening to baseball on the radio. I think it's one of the most relaxing things there is in the world. And again, I'm showing my age, but but I like that. Um, you know what, Tim? The best way I can describe it is I'm not sure what lies ahead. And I think for, to some people that might be a little scary or create some anxiety. I'm I'm fine with that. I don't even know what I'm going to miss yet. You know, what parts of the game? I mean, for sure, it'll be the people, but... I don't know what else, and, and I'll deal with that as we go, but I'm looking forward to to doing some golfing and doing things I've never done. Like I went I went to the Arizona basketball game the other day. I've never been able to do that. Um, I went to the Pac-12 tournament. I've never been able to do that. I'm doing stuff that I haven't done, and I'm looking forward to that. Tito, what would you say is the most mindless thing you now get to do with your new free time is it a certain tv show that you think to yourself i can't believe i watched this or is there an activity around your house that you now get to do that you haven't been able to do before jeff let me tell you you're, you're probably gonna laugh but when i get up in the morning you know i have a cup of coffee first thing i do and then my next decision is hey do i want another cup of coffee <laughs> instead of Rushing out of the house because I got to get to the ball. My whole life felt like it was on a, you know, like I got to be here by nine o'clock. I got to be on the bus at eight thirty, and now it's like you know maybe I'll have another cup of coffee. That that is great, Tito. What about cribbage? Cribbage was the game that you played every day with your own players, which I found unbelievable. Tito, I mean, with Petey and with Josh Tomlin and people like that, do you still play cribbage? Is there anyone for you to play cribbage with? No, and that might be my biggest source of not feeling so happy because I love cribbage. I got cribbage boards all over my house, <laughs> and I have nobody to play with. I, I play on my phone because I, I love it so much. But um, the, the basketball coach here, Tommy Lloyd, who I love, he said he learned how to play cribbage. So I'm going to go find out one of these days this week if he actually really did learn or, you know, do I have to kick his ass or right, we'll, we'll right. see. And, and Tito, <laughs> tell us about the time that Jonathan Papelbon, great dude, great closer, came to you and said, can I join in the cribbage game? Explain that. You know, Pap, bless his heart, is one of the one of my favorite guys. And me and Pedroia were playing and Pap came in and, he goes, I want to play. <laughs> and, you know, we're like, oh, man. 
I, I kid people, I tell people I kind of built most of my basement with that, with, with Pap trying to learn how to play cribbage. <laughs> and Tito, you're used to playing games with guys. Tell us the story when you managed Michael Jordan in the minor leagues. I know there are a million Michael Jordan stories, but just tell us about a typical bus ride on the Jordan Cruiser through, you know, through the Southeast. What was that like being on the bus and the games you played with the greatest basketball player of all time? You know, it took me a little while to realize, you know, I'd look at him sitting on the bus and he looked so content. And it took me a while to realize he was content. You know, nobody could get at him for those six, eight, 10, 12 hours. And as miserable as most of us were, he loved it <laughs> because, you know, he could play Yahtzee. He could, he could read a, whatever he wanted to do. He didn't have a microphone stuck in front of his face or somebody trying to get an autograph. And he wasn't used to that. And he, and he loved it, but we'd play cards. We'd play Yahtzee. The one thing is when you play something with him, it's for real. <laughs> Like there's no funsies. Like, you know, you're you're playing for real. And I found that out real quick. Right. And Tito, sorry, second and last Jordan question. When you got back from a road trip once, you told me the story that you guys got off the bus, some guys were chirping, and before you know it, Jordan and the coaches from the Birmingham team are in a basketball game. Tell us what happened like at the beginning of that game. Well, let me back up. We're coming back from Huntsville. And, you know, the, my two coaches were Kirk Champion and Mike Barnett, who today are my, some of my best friends. And they're, they're on the bus and they're talking about basketball and who's better. And, you know, they both stink. And, and MJ's ears perked up and I'm like, oh man. <laughs> so we get back to, you know, Birmingham and my apartment complex. I had a cement basketball court on my property because you know, you got to remember, I'm making $28,000, not living in the greatest part of town. And so we're shooting around and there's chain nets. And here comes MJ. And, you know, one thing leads to another. And, you know, when MJ's there, word of mouth spreads in a hurry. So all of a sudden, here come these, I call them kids. They were men from the neighborhood. And we're playing four on four. And they're big, big, strong kids. And it starts to get a little rough and I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting nervous. And cause I can tell MJ starting to get a little bit, you know, mad. So he's at the top of the key and he's got the ball in his arm like he does. And he tells the guy, he goes, I'm going right there. And I remember thinking, Oh no. <laughs> so I ran over to set a pick and he put the ball back in his arm and he goes, get out of here, dumbass. <laughs> so, you know, I, waddled back over to where I was. He took one dribble and he picked the ball up. And I remember thinking, this is not good. And the next thing you know, he, the ball went through the hoop, the hoops bent. He's standing over the guy and he's like, don't ever talk to me in my house. And I'm like, game's over. <laughs> but it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And the worst part was the HOA of the apartment building made you pay for the rim at that point. <laughs> it, it, it was one of the most incredible. I remember thinking we got to get out of here before somebody gets right? killed, but it was. <laughs> this is so beautiful. He didn't need anyone to set a screen or a pick right. for him in oh, 20 yeah, years. I, he... And here Tito sets a screen. It's the most <laughs> insulting thing I've ever heard. If you could, if you could look at the, you see the look on his face, like get out of my way. <laughs> what are you doing? Now, Tito, if, if for those who may be watching on YouTube, a lot of people just listen to the podcast, but um, we have we have a kind of a relic, you would say. This is uh, the iconic Terry Francona on a scooter, Cleveland Indians at the time, bobblehead, when the bobblehead giveaway was happening at the stadium, you on your scooter. And you actually had somebody join you on your scooter. <laughs> What's Jim yeah, Gershon? that would have been... Yeah, that would have been dumb and dumber. <laughs> you, you know, if for people that know that movie, we really, when I saw the video, we looked exactly like dumb and dumber. It was, but you know what? In Cleveland, I mean, I lived two and a half blocks from the ballpark, which for me was a little too far to walk. And I didn't want to drive. And I would zip in and out. The clubhouse guys would point it 
point at the, you know, leaving when I'd come in and I'd go down alleys the wrong way. You know, if we had fireworks, I'd zip out of there. It's Cleveland. People were friendly. The policeman would high five me after games or tell me to hang in there. I parked it outside my apartment, never locked it. And it finally got stolen with four days to go in my 11th year. But it, so, I mean, that just tells you about Cleveland. You can park it downtown and not lock it. Yeah. Tito, I used to work in the Halley building. So I was right around the corner from the stadium and I was leaving work one day and there was some traffic stopped. And all of a sudden you see the manager of the Cleveland Guardians <laughs> driving across the street on ninth. It was the best thing to ever happen to me. Yeah. And the day I went, we went around the bowels of the stadium, Lloyd Christmas and Harry Dunn <laughs> from Dumb and Dumber. And before I could even get off the line, Tito already has, well, this is really dumb and dumber. It's this. We had so it, much fun doing perfect. that. Yeah, it was, it was perfect. So Tito, this is a, this is a relationship show. It's, a father and a son and your dad the beloved tito was a really good major league player tell what's your greatest takeaway when you were a kid and you were with your dad in a baseball setting well you know he played 15 years and i was i think 11 and a half when he finally retired so the last you know early on you know because times are so different you know when i was four or five six years old you know, we only went maybe for a couple of weeks to visit because they, you know, they didn't make very much money and we had school and stuff like that. But then in the summertime when he was in Atlanta, uh, Milwaukee, you know, I was old enough where I'd go into the ballpark with him, but you couldn't go in the clubhouse. You just, you know, times have changed. He'd give me a dollar and I would go from one thirty to when the game was over at 11 and I had to make that dollar last and I would go stand out in the outfield and try to get home runs with, you know, they were hit out of the ballpark. I knew every usher. I knew every ticket taker. It's probably too, because today that's probably why I love those people so much because they were so good to me when I was growing up. I found ways to get a free Coke or a hot dog or, you know, I, I just made do. But my dad knew that I was watching every pitch of the game. And in fact, my, my, if I was, if I was in trouble, my penalty was I couldn't go to the ballpark. And it happened once in like three and a half years because I loved going so much. On the way home from games, I was probably the only eight year old that sat in the back seat and learned when you're eight that you pitch up and in, down and away. I listened to everything and my dad knew it. And I think he realized that, hey, I was, you know, there might be kids out there screwing around. I was attentive to what was going on because I just didn't want to miss anything. Did you ever have an opportunity? Because some of my best memories with my dad were like driving up to Cooperstown, just the two of us to go to an induction weekend. Did you ever get to travel with your dad when he was playing? His last year in Milwaukee. And again, this is before this, you kind of pull this stuff off. He took me on a 10 day road trip. Um, we went to uh, Kansas City, and that was the old ballpark in Kansas City, the old ballpark in Minnesota, and the old ballpark in Chicago. And, you know, when I left, my mom had bought me a sport coat and my hair was combed. And they said, when I got off that, that road trip after 10 days, man, I looked like I had been gone three years. <laughs> but it was probably the best, funnest 10 days of my life. I mean, they 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 dressed me up in Chicago cause so I could go on the field. They put me in Tommy Harper's uniform. They taped it around me so I could go out and shag. And and to this day, you know, people ask me all the time who like some of your favorite players were. And, you know, being a left hand hitter, people always think you're gonna pick a left hand hitter. My all time favorite player was Al Downing. And the reason being is when we were on that first flight, you know, I'm sitting with my dad and I'm pretty, pretty stoked. And Al Downing comes up and grabs me. And he said, Hey, young man, he goes, I got an extra seat here. Come back and sit with me. You know, when you're, when you're 11 years old, you know, I thought I was on the team. Like I thought I was part of the team. And to this day, like when I would see Al, I tell him that, and he would light up. 
that that is so great, Tito. So all at this shaped your baseball life, not only having a dad, but being around other players who taught you what being in the clubhouse was all about. My dad and I knew like if I wanted to be around there, I better be respectful. And and I I I think I learned some valuable lessons. I mean, I learned I learned basically at a young age to love and respect the game, which is two pretty good words in my opinion. You know, not just only respect how you play the game, but respect the people in the game. And man, that's a pretty valuable lesson. You know, you're absolutely right. Growing up around baseball and baseball players like I had the opportunity to, that was the most important thing is you and myself, we had access that most 11-year-olds would not have, but there was that expectation from your dad, your hero, your best friend to, you better command yourself like 25, not like you're 11, and that has been the greatest gift my dad has given right. me. Right, and if I may, uh, Jeffrey Kirchin sang out, sang the national anthem <laughs> at Progressive Field. It's the only, and he's he's like 25 years old. It's the first and only time I've ever seen him nervous, Tito, before he did anything. And it's worth noting, sorry to interrupt, this was 2016. This was this incredible season with, you know, Tito is the manager. They made it all the way to the World Series Game 7. This team is excited. The city is in love. So the place is packed. It's packed, and I'm scared to death because my son's singing the national anthem, and the last person he sees before he goes to sing is the bald-headed manager for the Indians. And, Tito, what did you tell him? Well, I gave you really good advice, didn't I, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know what? I painted it on a poster, and I hung it up in my room the next day because it was that inspiring. He looked at me, and Tito Francona said, all right, well, don't f*** it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I will never forget that for the rest of my life. And it actually relaxed me, believe it or not, because it made me laugh. Yeah. And if that's the way, this is why he's been such a successful manager. Right. Is he pretty, elo pretty eloquent, huh? Right. <laughs> he deflects all right. anxiety yeah. and all conflict by making us laugh and smile. He did the same things with his players. And that's why Tito was such a great manager for all those years. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was as much fun as I thought it was going to be. Guys, it, it, it's a pleasure. And, and Jeff, I'm going to embarrass you for a sec, but your dad is one of not just my favorites, but everybody's favorite. And you come from good stock, man. I, I oh. it, it, it just, when, when, when people ask me about Tim, my eyes light up and he's just, so much of what's good in our game. And I, I love that. Well, thank you so much for that, Tito. And again, thank you for joining us. It was my pleasure, guys. Thank you, Terry Francona, for joining us. We really appreciate you. Next week, we have Mike Shore joining us, who is a massive seam head. He also is the creator of Parks and Rec, was a big part of the American office and Brooklyn Nine-Nine he created as well. So be ready for him. I know he's not a manager of a baseball team, but this guy knows baseball and loves it, just like everybody who listens to this podcast. Now, before we close out, I... Dustin Bedroya was brought up during that interview, and I want to hear if you have any great Dustin Bedroya stories because well, I loved watching him growing up as a small guy. What is your Dustin Pedroia story? So do you know the story, David I, Ortiz? I do. I want you to tell it. So Dustin Pedroia is accepting some sort of award, and this video goes, goes viral because he tells a story about Big Poppy, and obviously they played together for years and, and batted next to each other in the lineup a couple seasons as well. And... um. There was this guy meeting up with Dustin. Said, Dustin, Dustin, come over here. And <laughs> David Ortiz looks at him and said, what do he call you? As, as if David Ortiz is going to go beat this guy up for calling him some mean name. He goes, right. call me Dustin. He said, why do he call you that? Yeah. <laughs> and, and Dustin goes, because that's my name. <laughs> my name is Dustin. And everybody, including Big Poppy, called him Petey. But then Dustin said, I mean, this guy played how many games with me? And here's over the speaker, now batting, Dustin Pedroia, and, and never listened to the, Look, <laughs> the announcers? Love, love Big Poppy, not surprised by this. <laughs> As for Dustin Pedroia, Jeff, and you can't see this on a podcast unless you have video, but I have really big hands for a little guy. Dustin Pedroia's hands are half the size of mine, and yet he was an MVP, he's a borderline Hall of Fame player, one of the best players I've ever seen. But all you ever need to know about a little guy, because he's five, six and a half. Don't read that he's five, nine. I've stood next to him. I know what little looks like. So he used to get to the ballpark eight hours before every game. 
So David Ross was his teammate one year in Boston, or maybe more than one year. And David Ross like lived in the same neighborhood. And David Ross is going to breakfast at 11 o'clock in the morning. And it's a seven o'clock game and Petey's on his way. So Rossi says, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to the ballpark. It's eight hours before the game. But that was his routine. And this is a true story. Once a year, they play Patriots Day at right. Fenway Park. Mm-hmm. And the game starts at 11 o'clock in the morning. And he went to the clubhouse at 3 o'clock in no the morning. Way. Yes, he did. He alerted the clubhouse guys, I'll be there at 3 o'clock in the morning. You better have it opened up for me. Because that was part of his routine. He had to get himself ready for the game. 3 a.m., he showed up for an 11 a.m. game. That sounds a lot like you, unfortunately. <laughs> Not only are you both small, you both love to get places early. Right. But I got big hands. Right. Thank you so much for listening to Is This a Great Game or What? New episodes every single Tuesday. Thank you so much for being part of our family. <laughs>